let's get into the video. But of course, first I've got to thank my patrons, a special thanks to Some Hobo 101, Average Morning, Yoris Letter, Hades Zorko, Rene, Evgeny, Art Farrell, Budaray, Emery Baldwin. If anyone else is able to help support the channel monetarily, the link to my Patreon is down below. If not, there are links down below to other social media, such as Twitch, Twitter, and Discord. If you could help me out by following on any of those, it'd be greatly appreciated, and let's get to the video. So before we start the video, I'm going to mention that the code for this project, most of it is on GitHub. If you go to the Dapper Tools package, you'll be able to get all the state machine code. But the code that I've used in this video to actually build up this little test enemy I'm going to show you in a minute, that code isn't available on there because it's part of the game I'm working on. This is private on GitHub. But eventually, when I've put more time into it and more effort, when I when I get more time to do it, I'm going to make some examples in the Dapper Tool package. So you can go to like an example scene. If you're used to using other packages, they usually have example scenes showing off the stuff in the package and how it works so that it's essentially like, you know, documentation examples, but in the actual Unity editor itself. So it's pretty cool. We're going to get around to that eventually. But for now, just follow along with the video. I'm sure you guys will be fine. So this little enemy I've built doesn't actually do any attacking yet, you know, there's still plenty more features I need to build, but I wanted to get the basic logic working, which is it's just a stationary enemy that um, has different states, and one of the states is the idle state, where it's essentially just searching for a target, and then when it finds a target, it locks onto it, and then eventually I'm going to, you know, implement some shooting mechanics so it can actually start attacking the player, and then when you leave its range, it stops aiming at you, right? So I'll just show it in action right now. If I manually move the player closer, you notice how I get into a certain range and it'll snap onto me like that. And then it follows me around, you know, I can go over here and it follows me around like this. And then I can, for example, disable the gravity behavior, which is one really good thing about splitting all this up. I can just disable gravity behavior and then now the enemy doesn't have uh, gravity at all. And it can aim at me up here and if I move across, obviously it follows me around. I can come down over here. Well, I can like enable gravity again and fall down. So this enemy has his, uh, is in the state of aiming right now. And then if I, for example, move away enough, it'll stop aiming at me. So when I move over here now, it's not aiming at me, right? It's just aiming over there. Now, I could make it do whatever I want. The point is, for this enemy, I've not written any specific code for this enemy, which means that whenever I make anything else in the game that has any similar functionality, I can just reuse that code. Now, I'm not saying the code I'm writing right now is perfect. Obviously, I've written it quite recently, and I'll probably go back and refactor it at some point. But the point is, it's a pretty good proof of concept. I'm going to show you what I've wrote, and why it works and why you should use it. And then obviously it's up to you to build up your own implementations of it. So let's go to the package now. So you see here the enemy uh, as a child has a state machine. This is just the way I uh, recommend we set this up. Eventually I might make some editor window to do all this in to make it all fancy, but I don't know how to do that yet. I I've seen tutorials on it, but I'm not gonna waste time building a nice editor window. You can just do it yourself. Um, you put a child of the thing you wanna give a state machine, give it the state machine. Uh, it can be called whatever you want technically, but it makes sense to call it state machine and then in here you just add a state machine behavior and then all the children are the actual state so if we go to the state machine behavior and then we zoom in a bit okay so this is a mono behavior remember and just like i've explained in my video two videos ago in unity um we have the behavior and then we have the implementation and the behavior is used to inject any data into the implementation you need so for example the state machine needs to know what state to start on so it's up to the mono behavior to reference that state and then to pass it in on the constructor right and then over here every frame we call tick on the state machine because state machines need to tick every frame to do their logic so i just pass in a tick and then uh, change state can happen. Uh, if you, for example, want to force a state change rather than setting up an actual condition diagram. So if you've, if you've ever used state machines before, you'll have conditions for when it goes from one state to another. And I've made it so we support conditions, but we also support just telling it to go to a certain state. Now the built-in Unity animator actually does this too. You can uh, set up like, oh, if the float is bigger than one, then go to this state. Or you can just say, go to this state, right? Um, so I've got that functionality here, and if we go into the state machine itself, uh, the logic is basically uh, in the constructor, we want to change state to the starting state, which is the one they've passed in. And all we do is we say, well, the change state function will exit the current state, and this question mark means we'll only exit the current state if it's not null. So obviously if we just called that and it was null, then we'd get an error. So exit the current state if there is one set it to be a new state so like cache store this state here so this we always store which state we're currently in and then call enter on the new state right okay and it's an i state because uh, the state machine shouldn't know what a state really is it should know what a state kind of has but not how it works that's why we're using interfaces instead of implementation um and then down here for ticking also it means that when you do unit testing it's a lot easier uh, you can use mocking libraries but here we're basically saying okay when we process transitions uh, on a state, we actually get back a an i state. 
Now that could be null or an actual state. If it's a state, it means we want to go to it. Otherwise, don't, right? So make sure, check if there's conditions to go to uh, a new transition, sorry, a new state via the transition. If there isn't, then we don't do this here. But if there is, we do it, right? We go to that state. Now, next thing to show you going down here is, well, the interface iState uh, has an enter, an exit function, and a process transitions, okay? Now, if we actually go to the implementation, we pass in a state, okay? So a state is obviously an iState. Now, I've made it a serialized mono behavior, and that's just something to do with this uh, add-on I've got called Odin Inspector. I've mentioned it quite a bit, but I've wanted to make this supported for people who don't have it. Now, in an upcoming Unity version, they're making it so you can actually serialize interfaces, which you can't currently do, but eventually you're going to be able to do it. Now, if I just go in here, I can't quite remember. Yeah. So the reason I did it is because I want a list of I conditions. Now, the problem is in Unity, you can't expose a list of I conditions. You can't expose an interface or a list of interfaces or whatever. Soon we'll be able to do that. We can't right now. So keep in mind, guys, this is my private project. Like this is my, um, you know, it's, it's in my own repository. So I've used all the Odin stuff here. But in the actual public one you guys use, it's not the exact same code, okay? It's slightly different, but eventually it'll look like this where we'll be able to actually serialize a list of I conditions. And all a condition is, is uh, something that has a boolean let me go to it so we have a bool function for whether it is met or not and then we can actually i've made it an extension function if you have a list of i condition you can actually just call con like conditions dot are met and then uh it returns for you whether they are all met okay it's just a nice little helper function so over here you say um where are we i've got lost now okay let's go into state machines state machine we want to say process transitions, which is in the state, process transitions. So we say for each transition, check if the particular transition conditions are met. So you can imagine, let's go into paint real quick. You might have your character with an idle state, right? Let's say this is the idle state. And then you might have a, a running state over here. Okay. So the condition to go to the running state might be, you know, pressing move or whatever. And then the condition to go back to the idle state is, you know, releasing move. So you've got these conditions, right? You've got a single condition and that condition's result is to go to the state. So what you do is you have um, these transitions with their conditions. So the condition to go to a state might be you press a key or it might be you press a key and you're in the air. Or, you know, you can have a list of all the conditions that need to be met. Maybe you, your condition is you need to be a certain level, right? An I condition can be used like anywhere in your game that you want to have conditions that aren't hard coded. You just pass them in. Um, obviously, for me, it's a lot easier with this uh, list of I condition. Technically, you guys can do it right now if you just make a base class condition and you inherit it. The problem is it would have to be um, either a scriptable object or a mono behavior, which makes it a bit annoying. It's not ideal. Ideally, you just want to use normal classes. Um, it's just problems of Unity serialization. You'd have to think of workarounds for them. But from a transition, you can get the next state. And if you uh, if all the conditions are met, you should transition, right? So what it does is, if you should transition, then return the next state. So we we for example might say, yes, you know, this is this is idle, idle, and this is like walk because obviously I've, it's so hard to write in paint. Um, so condition to go from idle to walk might be, as you said, you press a key, and when walk goes back, you release a key. So pretend that condition was pressing a key. Well, because pressing a key has been met, we then transition to the next state. So we return the state, so we go back to here. And because it's not null, because we just returned it, we will change state to go to that state. So now we can actually set up via conditions, um, state transitions. So you can have state A and state B, to go from state A to B, you need to meet a certain condition. And if you do meet it, then you go there, okay? And the benefit to a state machine, or the reason you'd use it in general, is to set up enemy logic, player logic, UI logic, anything, right? Anything that has different states that it needs to go between, it's no good hard coding it because obviously you can do that and people make enums, but enums, you need to edit the code and recompile if you want to add to it. You ideally don't want to have to do that. You just want to be able to piece together things you already have. So if you look at how I've got this right now, I've got uh, the state machine. The starting state is the idle state, which is this one here. And what happens is in the idle state, it's active, right? It's a, the game object's active. And if I move the player closer and so that it's in the shooting range and it changes to that state, you'll notice how idle gets deactivated, shooting gets activated. And now it's technically not shooting, it's just aiming, right? Um, and all I do is I have unity events. 
that get raised when I enter and exit so that I can then hook into different things to say what happens when we enter and exit the state. And as I always say, the benefit of Unity events is that they um, allow you to do whatever you want, right? I don't have to start hard coding loads of different state scripts and different implementations because there's no point. Because the thing is, if you have one in one place and you want something else that's slightly different, you have to then modify it slightly and then you've made another script and you have to inherit it and it gets a mess. It's always better just to make everything as generic as possible. Now with ECS coming, ECS would be a very good solution for all this um, eventually because it would just mean um, the, the problem with Unity events is they're not the most performant. Like they don't really cause problems unless you're, you know, calling them every single frame. Now the thing is you're not, you know, raising on enter and exit every single frame. You're not going to be going in and out of states every frame. Now, obviously, as well as doing stuff when you enter a state and exit a state, you might want to do stuff every frame while you're in a state. So there's, there's multiple ways to do this, right? It's up to you guys. The way I've implemented it is... Uh, it's up to you to just have an update function, right? You can have a function, you can have a class with an update function that gets called every frame. And as you guys probably know, the update function gets turned on and off. Well, essentially, the update function runs only when the, the component is active. So you can actually just deactivate the component or even the game object uh, that it's on, and that'll turn on and off the actual uh, update function. So you could either put that script on here, and because this game object gets turned on and off, it would only be ticking the update function when you're in this state, which is what you want. Or if it's on another object, like maybe the root game object, you might want to toggle something on and off here. You can do that, right? It's quite easy. Um, I've got this get target behavior, which I'm definitely going to have to refactor. But all it does is it says every so often just do an overlap sphere, which is like a raycast, but in a sphere. And then loop for all the things we found. And if any of them are targetable, then set that as our current target and raise the event saying, hey, we found a new target. Okay. Uh, that's the way I've got it currently for finding targets. So you have a targetable behavior. If anything is targetable in the game, you put this on it. And then, for example, the player, as you'd probably see, is targetable. And anything that's targetable has a target point because the origin of an object might not be where you actually want to be uh, targeted. Let's say that this thing is aiming at my target point, which is pretty much the center of the player. By default, the pivot point is the feet. Or the, yeah, are the feet, sorry. So what would happen is if I changed this or got rid of it, it would just be aiming at the feet. So it makes more sense to have an actual transform there. And then belongs to player. So he, he belongs to himself. Now the reason I have belonging to is because the belongs to behavior, if I look over here on belongs to, oh, it's down at the bottom, sorry. Uh, you have an owner. That's because let's say I summon a pet in the game, it will belong to me. So maybe I can do something with all the things that belong to me, right? So there are uses of these things um, that will play into the game I'm making. And then they also have factions. And the reason I've made factions is because you'll find games where maybe your abilities only hit enemies. But then if you tag things as like enemy and friendly, it's a bit annoying because then eventually you have to, well, first of all, with tags, uh, tags aren't great doing tag comparisons. And then um, layers aren't good either because you have to then tweak all the physics collisions and if you have you know you might have the player and the enemies but then what if you have maybe another faction that are friendly at some point but then you know they might be uh, hostile if you make a certain choice in a quest somewhere or maybe certain different types of enemies are hostile to each other right y you have all these different conditions that i think it makes more sense to just have custom logic in your game for factions so this is the player faction which would be the player and his summonable things and then we'll have enemies will have their own factions based on what they are. So maybe the faction could be demons or orcs or whatever, right? They're different races. And then those races I can tweak in the scriptable objects who they're hostile towards and stuff like that, right? So maybe um, orcs are hostile towards demons or whatever, right? It, it's up to you. So the way I've got it right now is currently this uh, enemy is hostile towards me. That's why it's aiming at me and it's going to start shooting me soon. Obviously, it's not going to shoot its own allies if I have more turrets. Um, if I actually go to prefabs uh, sorry a uh, game data npcs enemies turret if i go drag in the uh turret i need to go to the scene view sorry okay so if i go and drag in the turret now you'll actually notice it starts aiming at the player too so just from dragging it in at any point in the game it just starts working um which is obviously a really good benefit it's pretty cool you can go put it on top of this box it starts aiming so all these things are now aiming at the player and obviously with the player i can then move them around and they all keep an eye on me now if i get too far away then obviously they stop targeting me i've not made the range that big um obviously i can make the player go up so i've gone out of the range of this one down here but you know it's fine whatever just might want to put it a bit over here okay now they're all in range i think 
apart from the one over at that end. Maybe they're all in range now. Kinda, not really. But it doesn't matter, you see the point. Now, the reason why they uh, snap a little bit is because they don't actually do that check for the player every single frame. They do it every like half a second. Now, maybe you want it to be done every frame. Obviously, it's less performant. Uh, maybe you don't even want to do sphere casts. Maybe you want to use uh, actual colliders, but then I, I haven't tested the performance differences between all those methods. Um, but yeah, essentially, you have a state machine, has a state, and every frame it ticks the state, doing its logic. When it enters and exits, it raises an event so that the different states can do what they want. And then you can um, have conditions on a state to go to different states. So right now, these states don't actually have conditions because I found it easier to just say, like in the logic here, set, uh, you see here, state machine behavior dot change state to the shooting state. So when a target is found, go to the shooting state. Now this might not be the best logic, might not be the most solid logic, there might be bugs with this, I haven't tested it enough. But the point is, I'm saying go to the shooting state from whatever state you're in right now. Even if you're already in the shooting state, just go to it, right? Um, maybe I should put in logic saying if you're already in the state, then don't do anything. Or, you know, it's up to you. I might need to tweak it and improve it over time, and I'm sure I will. And then you see over here as well, we change state to idle when uh, we lose the target, okay? So that's what handles that. But maybe you have a different kind of state machine where it's uh, actually driven by the states. So you can click add a new transition. Now, because I've got Odin, I can say I want a new... A state transition which uh, has the next state okay so the next day is shooting and the condition is and then there's other conditions so I've got my different types of conditions I've got the grounded and the velocity one so for example uh, go to the um, shooting state if we're grounded and what does it need to know for grounded well first of all it's true or false because maybe it's actually uh, you want to go there if you're not grounded or if you are grounded so you can tweak that boolean to choose and then you also need to tell it which character controller should actually be grounded, right? So you just drag in the character controller. But this is just an example, right? Now, for you guys, if you wanted to do it without this, and you had to put in the conditions, or sorry, the, the, yeah, the conditions, you'd have to make them inherit from mono behavior. You'd have to add them to the game object and then drag them in as references, right? It's a bit more fiddly and a bit more annoying, but eventually we'll have to do that. And I'm looking forward to when the update comes out because then I don't have to keep using Odin just to do simple things like this. But yeah, uh, I think it's pretty cool. So I can say, okay, maybe you need to be on the ground and have a velocity of uh, a Y velocity that is greater than zero. For example, right? I've made some little example conditions. Um, so you can just keep making your own conditions and pass in the references you need. And all it's saying is, okay, I will move from this state, the idle state to the shooting state when I am grounded and my Y velocity is greater than zero. That's just a stupid example, but you can obviously build upon that. You might want to say, Oh, I can go from this state to this state when my character level is 10. Maybe you want to limit, you know, something you can do. Maybe let's say, for example, you unlock double jump at level two. Well, all you just do is the way the uh, transition condition to get to the jump state would be one of them would be you have to be at least level two. Okay, well, that makes simply a simple ex uh, example there. So yeah. Uh, I think that's it for this video. If you want to get access to this, obviously it's on my GitHub page. The code over time will change. It will, it will never, you know, be the same as this video because um, even by the time you guys watch this video, it's probably changed a bit and maybe I've upgraded it or whatever. So, you know, feel free to go and have a look around with it. Uh, a, a look around with it. Feel free to go... Feel free to go have a mess around with it. You know, if you find any way to improve it or any suggestions, feel free to leave those on GitHub. You know, do a pull request, make the changes yourself, send them to me, or just leave some comments on it or whatever. It's up to you. I will... I actively check the repository because I've had some people already uh, adding some new extensions and unit tests for it. So that's been quite helpful and pretty and cool as we grow the package. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe. It'd mean a lot. Leave suggestions down below for what you want to see. If you want to see more of these kind of videos, tell me what kind of best practices or principles or whatever you want to see. So yeah, uh, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching and goodbye.